And UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielina Tongvan people, the traditional caretakers of Tongvangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. Today, we are joined by Dr. Jerry Moore, who is a professor of anthropology at California State University, Dominguez Hills. His research focuses on the archaeology of cultural landscapes in Peru and Baja California. His archaeological fieldwork has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Geographic Society, the Wenner-Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research, the Center for Pre-Columbian Studies at Dumbarton Oaks, and other agencies and foundations. Moore has been a fellow at Dumbarton Oaks at the Sainsbury Center for the Arts, University of East Anglia, the Getty Research Institute, and the Institute of Advanced Study, Durham University. His book projects are numerous and endless and focus on the architecture and cultural diversity of South America. Most recently, he has published Visions of Culture, an Introduction to Anthropological Theories and Theorists, as well as numerous articles and book chapters. His forthcoming book, Ancient Andean Houses, Making, Inhabiting, and Studying, will be published in late 2021 by the University Press of Florida. And he is currently the editor of the Journal of Andean Archaeology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Moore. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. And thank you for that nice introduction. Um, and um, I, I don't know about you folks, but I, I kind of feel like I'm starting to emerge from out from underneath a rock. Uh, and this is a, is a great um, uh, experience to kind of begin to kind of uh, slide our way back into a sense of normalcy, which I hope is right around the corner. So thank you for this opportunity um, to talk about uh, my research and to share some of the ideas and hopefully some of the insights uh, with you as well. Um, let's see, next slide. There we are. Um, as uh, Carly mentioned, I have a book uh, coming out uh, called Ancient Andean Houses, Making, Inhabiting, and Studying. And um, the, the subtitle of the book is actually intentional uh, in that I see those three domains as being um, intersecting and overlapping uh, points of inquiry. Um, today, I'm going to be really talking almost exclusively about making ancient Andean houses and how archaeologists, I believe, uh, have um, there, there's still room for us to improve the way in which we think about uh, ancient houses by a focus on making. But um, uh, I'm just emphasizing this, not because I think that's the only important domain, but just because there's a certain limited amount of time that we have. Now, um, as some of you know, and as Carly mentioned, um, uh, I do a lot of work at home. I'm talking from my home uh, and my, uh, my research in, in, in many places has revolved around the home. And I, and I think of it as being one of these kind of centripetal places in the human experience, like the grave, like the hearth, like mountain peaks in some cultures around which multiple meanings and um, uh, 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 behaviors and expressions revolve. And so I, I found it a, um, a recurrent place to uh, think about my research, not only in the Andes, but also in uh, Southern California, and also, as we'll see in a moment, in, in Mesoamerica as well. Um, I don't know if uh, you folks know this great book uh, called Material World, but it's this photographic exercise that in which a group of, uh, of photographers uh, tried to get kind of um, uh, modal families in different uh, 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 societies around the world and ask them to bring all of their goods out to, in front of their houses. And so down here in the lower right-hand corner, um, we see a family in Nepal. Up here, uh, some folks in the upper left-hand corner uh, from the Silicon Valley. Um, and here, uh, those are from that project. And here in the upper right corner, uh, a classic uh, photograph of nomadic uh, peoples in Mongolia, and in the lower left-hand corner, um, a photograph uh, courtesy of Gustavo Politis 
of the Nukok, a, um, a highly mobile uh, foraging group that live in the Cambodian, uh, excuse me, in the Colombian Amazon. Um, and so what you see from these uh, are both the similarities and the differences between these very different experiences of home. And that I think poses certain um, uh, opportunities and challenges for archeological inquiries into domestic life, um, which I think we could do a better job of. Um, and um, what I have uh, basically, um, I, we, most of our approaches as archeologists to the home uh, have fallen into one of these different broad categories. So um, the first is what I call the passive container. Uh, after uh, George Carlin's great line, a house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it, um, which is kind of what the material world's uh, photographs uh, give it a sense of. Um, another thing, which of course is extremely common for archeologists, is to think about houses as being expressions of style and cultural conventions. Whether we're looking, for example, at the spread and adoption of uh, Inca architectural styles or Teotihuacan Tulum, Tolu Tablero in places like Camino Julio in the Maya region, we see these, uh, ex, uh, we view these structures as being ex stylistic expressions. Another uh, theme that really developed in the late 1970s, early 1980s was the energetics approach. And um, this was a uh, work that, uh, uh, for example, Elliot Abrams did uh, looking at uh, the energy going into building uh, various Mayan constructions. Um, but uh, it's also um, uh, prominent, for example, there's a book that I've read about, I haven't read this book yet because it's not quite published, but um, a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Barnabas Calder uh, has, is just publishing a book called Architecture from Prehistory to Climate Emergency, which apparently, according to the, the reviews I've seen, really focuses on the energy sources that go into constructions of different kinds of houses. Um, another energetics approach we see in archeology span comes out of uh, relatively recent work that folks like Michael Smith and Timothy Kohler and many others um, have done on the emergence of inequality, uh, particularly looking at the house and house size as being a really good expression of uh, inequality. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and that is a, a, a line of research that I would, uh, I, I critique, but I'm not gonna do that today. Um, instead, I, what I want to do is I wanna make the argument that um, we need to reinsert the house into household archeology. span That is the fundamental takeaway of today's discussion. Um, households and houses have had a long, history of uh, being points of interest in Americanist anthropology. And uh, you know, just as a, a touchstone, we can look at Lewis Henry Morgan's Houses and House Life of the American Aborigines, in which uh, Morgan argued that house, form were, uh, house forms were reflections of, this, uh, of the socio-evolutionary um, classes of different societies in the Americas. Um, but household archeology, span has a much more recent, I think, um, coalescence. Um, it really emerges in the late 60s, 1970s, 1980s, in such work as Kent Flannery's The Early Mesoamerican Village, just to name a prominent example of that. Um, and it remains a really essential part of, of archaeology. So, for example, uh, Jeremy Sabloff, uh, a couple of years ago in an interview in Sapiens, talks about the role of household archeology span as, as contributing to the archeology span of the 99%. Um, and I think all of that is true and all of that is important. But what I think is being overlooked in some of this is the house um, and the house in household archeology. span And I'm gonna um, uh, argue that we need to have a much more sophisticated knowledge of houses as part of our archeological inquiry. Um, for example, um, our, my colleagues who study uh, uh, arch the archeology span of ceramics, many of them have actually thrown pots. 
And the vast majority of the archaeologists I know who work on chipstone uh, technologies have actually made uh, chipstone tools. But my guess is the vast majority of we archaeologists who work on household archaeology have never built a house. And I think that lack of engagement with the act of making has um, um, influenced our, um, our research. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't get this insight until after I had completed my own doctoral research, right? <laughs> Which is, um, and, but I was fortunate enough to participate in a research project that my colleague and wife, Dr. Janine Gasco, directed down here on the southern coast of uh, Chiapas in southern Mexico um, in the region that's known as a Soconusco. And this was really one of these um, un unexpected opportunities that utterly transformed my way of thinking about archaeology and the house. Um, the reason the region of Soconoch or Soconusco, it was an Aztec province. It was a Spanish crown colony. The reason for this kind of imperial interest is largely due to the fact that it grew some of the most outrageous chocolate known anywhere in the Americas. Um, and uh, Jan went down beginning in 1979 and continuing to write about this region to this present um, in order to uh, look at uh, Soconusco and to look particularly at the late post-classic and colonial experience in the region. Um, and she worked uh, out here uh, in a little uh, settlement called Acelocalco, uh, which is just outside of the town of Capetawa. And um, what she discovered in the, her research were the remains of a late post-classic and to um, a kind of colonial period settlement um, that um, was abandoned around 1767. And what she found, the first thing we, we found when we went out there for the first field reconnaissance was the, the foundation stones of the corner of the church that were exposed here in this roadbed. Um, but in the course of Jan's uh, excavations, uh, she found um, a, a series of these uh, rather robust uh, cobblestone foundations uh, like you're seeing here in the excavations that are being done on the 12th of April of 1983. Um, and um, these structures um, we referred to uh, in the original research as being intact foundations. And we rather quickly realized that these were the intact foundations associated not with adobe walled structures, but rather with pole and thatch structures some of which still remained uh, being built and occupied in the region. Um, those uh, foundations are not load bearing, a point that I'll be important in just a moment, but rather were designed to keep the lower edges of this um, palm thatch out of the mud and keeping it from rotting. Um, and so when we did the excavations and mapped the structures, um, we classified these foundations as being intact structures, um, uh, partially completed structures. And then in various places, there would be these stone piles that we referred to as like piles of building material or cairns or cheech piles or things of that sort. And that was how these places were interpreted in that initial phase of the research. Um, but in 1989, um, we had the opportunity to go back and do another project that Jan directed that in part was looking for um, uh, colonial, additional colonial town sites. And uh, basically to get me out of her hair, Jan said, okay, why don't you go and do a study of these pole and thatch houses? And it was, a, it was a tremendous and transformative uh, experience in my development as an archaeologist. Because as I mentioned a moment ago, um, it turned out that these, these foundation stones were not load bearing. They were basically a, a, a moisture barrier to keep the thatch from rotting. 
And what the load bearing portions of these structures were, were these upright posts. Um, that then led us to work with local uh, Campesino experts uh, to try to get a sense of which woods were most preferred and which were most durable. And um, the thing that was really striking was how much a difference there was between different species. So for example, there was this one class of, of wood um, that was a harder wood that would last in excess of 20 years. And again, I should point out that 20 years as an upright post stuck in a, uh, a, 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 the ground in an environment that receives somewhere around three meters of rainfall per year. Okay. Um, other species, on the other hand, uh, would last less than a dozen years. And so we, uh, what happens is that if the thatch starts to go, or even if the rafters go, you can re basically refurbish the structure. But if the upright posts go, you have to completely rebuild the house. And so what we realized was that there would be points at which increased demand on particular species of hardwoods would result in there being less of the prime quality wood, having to use less quality wood that would last less time. And yet the enduring aspects of these houses, these stone foundations would be reflecting not an increase in population, but a decrease in the longevity or use life of a house because of the tree species that was involved. Now, that was really important for us. Um, and I'll never forget this opportunity I had to be talking to a lady um, and saying, okay, so she had this big post in her kitchen of this really dense hardwood. And I said, why is that post uh, here in your kitchen? She goes, it's been in every one of my houses. And she took me out to this yard here and showed me the traces of the three houses that she had lived in, in the immediate uh, area around this uh, uh, patio. She could name which kids lived in, were, were born in each of those houses. We could then check the year of birth in the local archival records. And sure enough, the use life of these houses had decreased in time until finally concrete block has all but replaced this kind of construction. That made me realize, and as an archeologist, that there was a lot going on in houses that I really didn't understand. And I think, uh, frankly, I'm not the only one. Um, I think one of the things in subsequent reading, I've, uh, I've been very impressed, and as I'm sure many of you have too, by some of uh, Tim Ingle's writings on making. And um, this is this um, a quote from uh, a, a passage talking about the, what he calls the hylomorphic model of creation in which form came to be seen as imposed by an agent um, to, with a particular end or goal in mind while matter thus rendered, I can't see the quote, um, uh, passive and inert was that which was imposed upon. And I think that has captured um, much of the way that archeologists have thought about houses and household archeology span as if they are these kinds of relatively straightforward uh, reflections of a cultural intent. Um, and I want to um, uh, argue against that, uh, not because I don't think houses are reflections of cultural intent, but I know that that isn't all that's going on. And um, I see this in a uh, one example. So I, in the ancient Indian houses, um, I write about different kinds of construction. So I write about um, uh, houses that are basically different kinds of wattle and daub, uh, pole and thatch constructions, different kinds of houses made from earth, different kinds of houses made from stone. Um, but today I just want to emphasize this one kind of house 
that is found in the uh, southern Peruvian Andes and adjacent areas of Bolivia, uh, known as uh, putuku. Um, and uh, this is a, a really uh, interesting kind of uh, house making. Um, as you can see, it's in part an adapt adaptation to uh, the Titicaca Basin, which um, uh, certainly from the colonial period and thereafter is basically all but treeless, except for places where eucalyptus and other uh, more recent species have been uh, introduced. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about how these patuco houses are just made, are, are made. But I want to um, uh, show or have as an argument um, against some interpretations that two of my colleagues, uh, Eric Marsh and Scott Smith, have made about uh, the site of Conco Juan County. Now, I want to clarify something here. Um, I'm going to critique these papers, these studies, because they're so damn good. Okay. Um, that's these, these are really terrific pieces of analysis. Okay. In fact, I sat on Scott's dissertation committee. Um, and so I'm going to critique their analysis, but I, I'm doing this in the sense that, you know, this is how our fields advance, that we take good pieces of work, try to say, okay, that, that's great for this and this and this, but this is a way that we can improve them. And so I'm offering this criticism, uh, this critique in that light. And I hope everybody understands uh, my intentions because what they did was this uh, great uh, piece of research. So Conca Wancani is located here on the other side of this mountain range uh, in Bolivia, south of from Tiwanaku. Um, there is this area that um, is, uh, they refer to as the, uh, patio group and compound three, and we're going to be really focusing on this uh, set of structures up here. Um, and here are some of the photographs of uh, their uh, project. So um, you have in some places uh, these uh, uh, st uh, stone foundation walls. Here is a picture of modern adobes uh, being made, and here is a um, uh, uh, a, a picture showing an in situ adobe uh, here at the at Conco Juan County. Now that little detail of that photograph uh, turns out to be uh, important uh, for reasons that'll be obvious in just a moment. What they excavated, and it's a gorgeous excavation. Um, they did these uh, excavations of this patio group where they found the remains of uh, a complex of multiple circular structures um, with a few rectangular structures uh, also. Um, and they're in their studies, they reconstruct this compound group uh, as I show you in, this is a picture of theirs in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and again, it's a, you know, that's a terrific piece of work. This is not just a, a, a two by two stuck down in the corner of a site someplace. This is a really major well done excavation. Um, and it leads them to propose, uh, and this is Eric's uh, uh, writing, um, an idea of the archaeology of community. Um, and what he's doing here is he's, dis uh, he's distinguishing these geographic communities uh, with the Anders Benedict Anderson idea of the imagined communities. Um, and so um, here I'm just going to read. Um, um, this quote, uh, refining an archaeology of communities has required more explicitly distinguishing imagined or relational communities from geographic ones. The reformer refers more broadly to groups with shared interests and identity, the latter are more specific as they require space. This makes geographic communities more anthropologically salient and more archaeologically accessible. The social construction of communities is driven through interaction. In geographic communities, residential proximity and a shared space create a phenomenological experience of living together, which facilitates interaction and in turn, community formation. I think that's a brilliant synopsis. I um, completely agree with that argument and hypothesis. I just don't think 
that the archaeological evidence that they've got at Konkawankani supports it as robustly as they would have us uh, uh, believe. Um, and what they argue, and again, this is Marsh, that you've got uh, consistently shaped built spaces that are uh, indicating shared building practices that um, emphasize water management and architecturally defined interaction boundaries. And this is important and extending their use life for multiple generations. Okay. Now, um, again, uh, I wanna make sure everybody <laughs> understands. I think that's all extraordinarily cogent and reasonable. Um, I'm just asking whether or not it's true. And I'm asking that having um, spent a little bit of time uh, reading about and looking at modern uh, Putuku structures. Now, these are really um, very interesting buildings. Um, they are Corbel vault constructions that are made from blocks of cut sod, which is known as champa, or sometimes adobes that are placed on top of these stone foundations. Um, uh, these construction techniques have been widely documented uh, by, for example, the architect Mauricio Marusi, who's based in Lima, and also by the anthropologist Sergio Chavez uh, in a widely available um, uh, text called Andean Past. Now, the thing that kind of caught my attention a couple of years ago when I was back at Dumbarton Oaks and working on this book project is that I was reading all of this uh, writing about domestic architecture in the Titicaca Basin. And I had never, I never saw, and I've yet to see a direct reference or citation of Sergio's work uh, in that literature. And maybe I've missed it, but I tried to be quite careful about it. And um, when I emailed Sergio uh, in 2017, he said, oh my God, Jerry, you're the first buddy person to have ever read that. <laughs> you know, it's like after 1998, he was so pleased to get, uh, have someone. And so he shared this. This is a picture of a much younger Sergio Chavez emerging from one of the Patuco houses that he studied. And he shared with me all of these um, extraordinary photographs uh, about uh, slides about how Patuco's made. So, uh, again, these are just great um, documentation. So here's a gentleman uh, cutting out these sod blocks. And you see he's using a, a classic Indian um, a foot shovel to do that. Um, and then uh, what they do is, again, there's usually a foundation of uh, stone if they have it. And then these get uh, built up in this corbelled arch uh, with the grass layer facing down until eventually they come in. Uh, there's some rafter work that goes on in the interior and uh, uh, that sets some kinds of limits on the sizes of it. But um, they, they're really kind of cool uh, constructions when you think about them um, that are not only, they, they are a clever adaptation to a region of limited natural resources. And, um, and again, these scholars have looked at um, these in depth. So you've got um, uh, Patuco today, either made from the cut sod or mud bricks. Um, the foundations are um, have to have at least uh, three rows of, of sod uh, in order to deal with the moisture. And I'm sure all of you know that moisture is the bane of any kind of earthen construction, whether it be um, uh, 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 rammed earth or adobe blocks and similar for uh, these sod houses. Um, but if you build the house out of champa, the use life is 50 to 60 years. If you build the house out of adobes, it's about a 10 to 15 year use life. So there's a significant difference in the uh, structure's uh, longevity. And as houses go into different states of decay, uh, they get repurposed. Uh, and Marusio, uh, um, and so you can see, here's a, just a photograph. Here's a, a house that has uh, a Patuco house. And this house has been then converted into now a tool shed. And um, uh, this is a great uh, photograph or, or drawing uh, from Marusi's work in which you have, um, you know, the, the house 
that is uh, being uh, lived in and the older house that is falling into display into decay, but it's good enough to hold the chickens. So it's being a chicken coop over here. Uh, it's be, uh, this uh, former house is uh, now used as a, uh, uh, a storage area. And there's actually a patuco outside the walled compound that you make as a dog house uh, for the pet. Um, and so one of the things that you see uh, in these uh, settlements are these houses go through different states of construction, use, decay, and repurposing. And um, I had an opportunity a couple of years ago uh, to make a trip to the region. I don't know the Titicaca Basin very well. I'd been there the previous time in the year 2000. Um, but with um, some of the photographs that uh, uh, Sergio sent me, you could see that same sort of evidence for the progressive repurposing of structures uh, in, his area, in his study area, which was on the Peruvian side. And again, this is a great photograph because you see that same sort of process uh, going on in one of his photographs. And in every house, Patuco house that I saw, um, you saw that same sort of evidence of uh, progressive um, use, decay, uh, and engagement with different functions over time. These are examples of the house working on human intention. These houses, in fact, require an adaptation on the part of their occupants and their builders. And I think that that's a really important insight because I believe that's true of all sorts of dwellings. Um, to give you an example, I'm, I'm sitting here talking from uh, my house. I live in Long Beach. The original part of my uh, house was built in 1912. Um, my house determines what brand of refrigerator I can own because the interior walls of the original structure are, are interior doors of the original structure are narrower than modern doors. So I have to choose my refrigerator based on that dimension in order to get it into my kitchen. Um, and uh, I could walk you through uh, my house. I'm sitting in my office now, which originally was the side porch. And you really get a sense of the way in which uh, structures, uh, dwellings, houses act on people uh, as much as people act on houses. And so if you go back to the Konko uh compound um, and you look at this, again, completely reasonable, great piece of field work, but if it, you eliminate the blue lines and you just draw in the stones, a rather different interpretation poses itself. Instead of seeing a whole, like a dozen or so contemporary simultaneously occupied structures, what seems at least as likely is that you see a progression of different houses built and then rebuilt and in many cases unbuilt to scavenge materials out of them um, such that if, instead of thinking about this as being a place where perhaps a dozen residence groups might have occupied this one compound, it seems at least uh, as likely that we're looking at maybe two or three residence groups something perhaps along the line of uh, elderly parents, their adult uh, children uh, who have married and their offspring, the sorts of things that we commonly uh, know from other uh, studies of domestic arrangements throughout the Andes. Um, and the thing I think that brings this to home is that, again, uh, nothing about this research project I think is slapdash. Um, what I think is missing from it, and what I want to try to reintroduce into archeological inquiry is a recognition about 
how the houses, our constructions are not just these pure reflections of cultural intent, but have their own properties that shape not only the engagement with the structures, but very much shape the archeological record. Um, based on what we know of from uh, ethnoarchaeology of particular constructions, uh, if those patugos were built out of adobe bricks, they probably lasted for 10 years or less. Uh, if they were all built at the same time, they probably did not last uh, for a generation. Uh, it seems more likely that this compound was occupied for generations with buildings being repurposed for non-residential uh, groups. And it also calls on us to kind of reinterpret the archeological traces as being perhaps associated with an extended family rather than a multifamily geographical uh, community. Um, and I think that there are, um, this is just one example and I can extrapolate from this into multiple cases, but I won't bore you any further. Um, I just want to quote here this, another section from uh, Ingold's work um, uh, on making, uh, consider a building not the fixed and final structure of the architect's design, but the actual building resting on its foundations in the earth, buffeted by the elements and susceptible to the visitations of birds, rodent and fungi. Um, he quotes the Portuguese uh, architect Alvaro Sisa as, as being frustrated that he can never really build the house he has in mind. But um, this point I would take, and I think archeologists should take, the real house is never finished. It's always going through these different sorts of assessments, invasions, modifications. And if we are lucky as archeologists, we are able to find the material traces at some point or stage in that dynamic set of processes and engagements. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, and also I want to acknowledge the various people that have contributed in different ways to this research.